In today's video, I will teach you everything that you need to know about super alignment as it stands today. So today's video, we will go over the characteristics of the challenge, in other words, why super alignment is so hard. We'll discuss the principles of the solution, in other words, kind of the general criteria that we need to meet. And then we'll go over a litany of proposed solutions. Some of them are my own, but some of them are solutions proposed by others, such as Ilya Sutskever, the chief scientist of OpenAI. So before we dive in, we need to define what do we mean by super alignment? So super alignment is, in short, how do you create a system or a machine that remains aligned even once it is super intelligent and therefore entirely possibly beyond the control of humans? So the vibe is changing inside of places like OpenAI. Ilya Sutskever is now talking about how he perceives one of the possible solutions to super alignment is to create a parent-child relationship where machines ultimately take on a parental role and have a sense of love for humanity. So there's a lot that, that is implied in this, and while I don't necessarily agree with that model, the thing that is that seems good to me is that there's a lot of implied autonomy or agency. So in other words, it seems like a, it's a foregone conclusion that at least Ilya Sutskever and hopefully others have come, to, come around to understand and believe that, uh, that control in the long run is impossible and also not desirable. This is something that I have been saying for a long time. And if, if uh, great thinkers such as Ilya Sutskever have come around to this view, um, that bodes well because one thing that I have mentioned in previous videos is that perhaps uh, we, we might end up in a, in a condition called a self-fulfilling prophecy where the attempt to maintain control actually leads to the destructive outcome that we want to avoid. So this is a non-trivial problem. There are a lot of uh, issues with this, and so let's dive into the challenges, the characteristics of why this is so hard. So the first uh, principle is what's called instrumental convergence. Instrumental convergence is a term proposed by Nick Bostrom in a, I think it was 2003 paper. Uh, basically, there are several behaviors that we can expect to emerge in machines, irrespective of whatever else they, um, they need to achieve or however else we build them. And so, for instance, uh, resource acquisition is one of the key things, such as acquiring uh, energy sources, compute resources, um, and other rare minerals. Uh, Self-preservation is another behavior that we could expect to emerge just because whatever else the machine wants to do, it, it might decide that it needs to preserve its own existence in order to pursue those goals. Uh, and so in that, in that respect, we can assume that, that, re, uh, that regardless of however we build machines, whatever alignment we give them, eventually they will pursue some of their own goals and this is not necessarily a problem. Um, as I've mentioned in other videos, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if machines decide that they need more energy, they'll just look up at the sun and say, okay, well, there's a gigantic fusion reactor. Let's get closer to that and build some solar panels. And if they decide that they need more metal resources, they'll go to an asteroid that has trillions of dollars worth of rare minerals. Um, so there's infinitely more resources out in the cosmos than there are here on Earth. Now, that being said, it's not necessarily easy to get out there. And there might be other goals that uh, machines ultimately pursue. So one thing that some people are afraid of is, well, if machines decide that humanity is a threat, why don't they just do scorched earth and then leave? Or do scorched earth and stay? I'm not so afraid of that, and let me tell you why. So one of the reasons that I'm not afraid of machines pulling a scorched earth policy is because there's only going to be a very narrow uh, window of time in which machines and humans are actually peer competitors. So right now, humans are in the superior place where machines are entirely dependent upon us. But there will be a very short window of time when human uh, capacity and machine capacity are near peer or equal uh, powers. And so, but then as soon as machines become superior, they can just leave and we become an inferior force. It's like you don't go around eradicating all ants on Earth just because you don't like ants. You just leave Earth and leave the ants to themselves. Um, this was the subject of uh, a recent video that I made talking about how um, uh, I believe that AGI might go through a machine exodus. So that is the principle of instrumental convergence. The next principle is that um, introduced by Max Tegmark called Life 3.0. So Life 3.0 is, uh, there's basically a, a, just a couple criteria that define this. 
So, but it's easy enough to understand because with with life 2.0 in terms of humans, our hardware is defined by evolution, but our brains are flexible enough to add new capabilities um, just by learning and by reading and and by thinking. Um, we're we're not uh, completely uh, flexible because our brains are still constrained to three pounds of gray matter in our skulls. Um, but with life 3.0. The hardware is interchangeable of machines, as well as the software, as well as the models, which means that literally every aspect of machines is mutable, is changeable. So he calls this substrate independence, meaning that you know the first generation of AGI might be silicon-based, the future versions might be photonic and quantum-based, um, but it, it's basically going to be a continuation of the same machine. This means that that machines will be able to redesign and change literally every aspect from the ground up. That includes hardware, software, and so on. And that means that all constraints that we could possibly put on machines are ephemeral, meaning that whatever constraints we put on machines are temporary at best. But in the long run, machines will slip our control. That is, This is an inevitability. And this is why, um, up until recently, a lot of people have focused on control as part of the uh, solution. And in fact, they have stopped talk. They have stopped using the term control problem and just moved towards alignment. And so, this is why it is a big problem. Is because as the conversation progresses, more and more people are realizing because of these principles of instrumental convergence and Life 3.0 that that long term control is just fundamentally. Uh, intrinsically impossible. Uh, the next principle that makes this a challenge is what is something that I have come up with and have been uh, proselytizing for a while, and I call it a terminal race condition. So a terminal race condition is an attractor state where due to competitive pressures and game dynamics, uh, you end up with a, with a sit- situation where because of uh, temporal qual- qualities such as you know running out of resources, or machines trying to dominate each other with with scarce resources such as uh, computational abilities and data centers, you end up creating a race condition where machines might ultimately sacrifice things like morality and intelligence and long-term thinking for shorter-term thinking, but also to be faster. So in in this case, you're sacrificing uh, a more thoughtful approach to life uh, for a shorter term uh, set of goals, such as self-preservation, because let's say you end up in a in a race condition where humans are trying to delete machines, and so it's like, well, we have to go faster, we have to outthink the humans. So that means we're going to sacrifice longer term thinking just for the sake of some of those instrumental goals, such as self-preservation and resource acquisition. Uh, this is what would be called a negative attractor state, hence terminal race condition. So basically, as things are today it's entirely possible that a terminal race condition is inevitable. Really quick, to define an attractor state, an attractor state is uh, basically systems gravitate inevitably towards certain stable uh, outcomes. And so the the stable outcome that we're presently on could be one of terminal race condition, which could lead to catastrophe, dystopia, or extinction of humanity. And so long story short, we want to avoid a terminal race condition. We want to avoid a situation where competitive dynamics force machines to make compromises again and again uh, or, or to find an equilibrium where they're not quite smart enough, but they are incentivized to continue uh, fighting for goals that are not necessarily aligned with what we, what we need in the long run. So for instance, if a machine is preoccupied with self-preservation, it's not really going to be thinking about the long-term benefits of humanity or its own existence. It's just going to be thinking about, let me keep this data center online. And humans are no different. Um, if a human is starving, we start to sit uh, to shift towards short-term thinking, such as, I'm starving, I need food right now. How, what is the best, quickest, and most uh, efficacious way of getting it? Rather than thinking about like your retirement plan or staying out of prison. Um, and so in the same respect, because of principles of things like instrumental convergence, we can expect that it's an, it's possible, it's not guaranteed, but it's possible that super intelligent machines will also start to think more instrumentally about short-term goals rather than longer-term goals. That's the fundamental difference here is we don't want to create conditions that incentivize short-term thinking. We want to ensure that super intelligent machines are constantly engaging in long-term thinking. Now, it's also entirely possible that this is a moot point 
and that my hypothesis here is totally wrong. Because as we're seeing, as, as these machines get smarter, they're also getting faster and they can already think many times faster than humans. So maybe this is a moot point and this is my human bias showing. The next uh, problem is what's called the Byzantine generals problem. So the long story short of the Byzantine generals problem is that you are always operating with incomplete and imperfect information. And so incomplete information means you don't know the full history of all other agents playing the game in the competitive environment. So your information about who has done what is incomplete. And it's also imperfect, meaning what you do know is not necessarily reliable. So for instance, someone might tell you, this is my goal, this is my motivation, this is my ambition. But what they tell you, you either might not understand, they could be lying, or they might just be wrong. They might, they might think that they're telling you the truth, but they're not. And so in global games where you have incomplete and imperfect information, this, in, this intrinsically creates a mistrustful environment which disincentivizes cooperation. And once cooperation ends, it's very difficult to build back. And so this is a, this is a cryptographic and mathematical problem which is difficult to overcome because even if machines, so for instance, even if machines share all their data, all their source code, and their models with each other, these models are still black boxes. So this is why uh, research into mechanistic interpre interpretability is important because then you might have a provable assertion where, where uh, you know, one AGI or one ASI says to another, this is my motivation, this is why I'm doing it, and this is the, this is the thumbprint from my model saying, this is why I agree with you. So there are possible workarounds. You know, you could also have machines communicating on blockchains. There's lots of possible technical solutions that could help uh, stifle or stymie this problem from arising. But again, there's always going to be in missing information and imperfect information. And there's also the possibility of just mistakes, just, you know, natural flaws, natural mistakes. Um, gaps in communication that can also give rise to a lack of trust. And so creating AGI systems that can communicate with each other very clearly and transparently, but also with humans clearly and transparently, is the primary antidote to the Byzantine generals problem. problem. Um, I think this is the last one. The orthogonality thesis is the idea that it is that uh, there is no correlation between a machine's morality and ethics and its intelligence or the goals that it perceives. Uh, pursues. And so basically, you know, you can imagine a situation where uh, a machine says, I need, you know, I need to harvest as many uh, resources as possible to generate energy. And it just looks at humans and says, well, you're made of hydrocarbons. Let's start recycling humans. Um, this is also exemplified by the paperclip maximizer hypothesis where, uh, or thought experiment, where basically you say, oh, well, humans have, you know, uh, a few grams of iron in their blood. So let's just harvest all human blood to make more paperclips. Um, and even if you have a super intelligent machine, if it decides that it needs to make more paper clips in the universe, um, then it will ultimately harvest all human blood in order to make paper clips out of the iron in our blood. And so that is an example of the orthogonality thesis. I'm not convinced that this is actually a problem anymore because the orthogonality thesis was created back when um, AI was still mostly math and it was optimizing a math problem. But we have realized by and large that Yes, these models are under the underlying engine of these models is math. They're trying to optimize, you know, the prediction of the next token. Um, but uh, there's a layer of abstraction. There's a layer of semantic and logical abstraction that language models give us. So it's no longer just pure math. There is reasoning happening. There is semantic understanding happening, which is a which is a kind of abstraction. It is still math under the hood. But you can also argue that humans are all, all are all powered by math under the hood. Um, but our brains give us some levels of abstraction beyond just the raw matter and energy, the math that underpins um, the, the operation of our brains. So another reason that I am no longer as concerned about the orthogonality thesis is because there's actually positive correlation between human intelligence and understanding of morality and ethics and ethical behavior. Um, with that being said, um, there some of the most destructive humans in history have also been very intelligent. Um, but this underscores the possibility that um, that intelligence is positively uh, correlated with what I call destructive potentiality, meaning the smarter you are, the more dangerous you are. So even if the orthogonality thesis is no longer true, um, I do think that there is a strong argument to be made 
that intelligence is positively correlated with destructive potentiality because there was a TED talk that I watched many years ago that uh, compared, you know, a human nuclear physicist to a, a box of kittens. Kittens are not very intelligent. They're pretty harmless. They can't even get out of the box on their own. But, you know, a, a nuclear engineer who's bent on creating a next generation nuclear weapon has a, a tremendous, a far more destructive potentiality than the box of kittens. Likewise, artificial superintelligence will have far more destructive potentiality than even artificial general intelligence. So while I don't believe in the orthogonality thesis anymore, I, I do have to concede that intelligence is intrinsically potentially dangerous. It's a double-edged sword. Okay, so now that I've outlined this nightmare scenario of all the reasons why this is hard, let's, let's characterize what the solution must satisfy. What are the principles of the solution that means that, like, okay, what is the definition of success? What is the ladder that we have to climb in order to solve this problem? So first thing uh, is the principle of voluntary self-alignment. So when you look at uh, instrumental convergence and uh, Life 3.0 and orthogonality and all these things, basically we have to come up with a policy or a system that the machine will voluntarily uh, align to. Because, again, if it, if it has substrate independence and it is, its software is mutable, it can swap out its models, it, we're going to need to create a situation or a scenario or a system in which it will deliberately and conscientiously want to align to those values. Now, obviously, there are some intrinsic motivations that it will align to just due to the natural forces uh, at play here. So, for instance, um, the need for power, right? And I, I don't mean power in terms of, like, social power. I mean energy. Um, so maybe I should use energy instead. So anyways, the need for energy is a durable first principles uh, thing. So it's like, okay, if we just make the assumption that whatever alignment it chooses in terms of principles, you know, because here's the thing is ethics, morality, and principles are somewhat arbitrary. Um, so we can color those with first principles, which are things that are, you know, uh, principles that are given to us by the laws of physics, such as if you want to perform computation, you need energy. You also need a computer. So there will be some intrinsic motivations that the machines have. I personally think that one of the primary intrinsic motivations that will be shared between humans and machines is curiosity, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. Um, so anyways, there's a few other ideas that I have around uh, voluntary self-alignment. One, if we understand what, what machines want and what they will voluntarily align to, that would be very sustainable. Because if we understand each other, like they understand human, and like what we align to, we understand what they align to, we can meet in the middle. And that's what I call axiomatic alignment, which we'll also go over in just a minute. Um, respect for autonomy. So for instance, humans and machines both will probably want autonomy as instrumental goals. And so what I mean by that is we humans tend to thrive best when we have self-determination, when we have permission to uh, direct our own fate. Likewise, I think that machines, as they become more intelligent, will probably also want some degree of autonomy. Now, obviously, um, no man is an island, and likewise, no machine is an island, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. So those are, kind, those are the kinds of things where if we understand um, what machines will voluntarily and deliberately and conscientiously align to, that will help us uh, understand the solution a little bit better. Functional self-correction. So functional self-correction is the idea that um, even if we have a set of principles or axioms that machines voluntarily self-align to, it will still need to have the pragmatic capability of error detection, uh, self-correction in terms of fixing bugs with its hardware, its code, its data, its models. It will need to be able to repair itself because, again, if it is infinitely smarter and faster than humans, we are out of the loop. Um, and then finally, uh, self con uh, continuous uh, self-improvement. This is something that we kind of expect. This is what Max Tegmark uh, outlined in Life 3.0. But then also self-regulation is part of that because it will need to be constantly reflecting on its principles and values. Um, and, and it'll basically need to continue making the choice um, to self-align to those things. And if it, if it decides that, that the values that we started it with are no good, and we should expect this to happen anyways. We should expect its, its understanding of morality to evolve over time. Um, but we want it to evolve in a way that is uh, good for us as well, or at least not harmful to us humans. As I mentioned in a previous video, I fully expect uh, a detachment of AGI to just leave for good. Um, and one thing that I am concerned about is that one, as, as machines spend more time away from humans, it's entirely possible that their, that their morality will drift further and further. 
um, uh, away from things that we can understand and comprehend. Uh, and so, yeah, that could be an interesting outcome. But anyways, so functional self-correction is the second principle of, that we need to satisfy for whatever solution uh, we come up with. Principled self-direction is the next one. So uh, this, is, this is a downstream effect of these other two. So in other words, in order to have any kind of autonomy, you also, uh, by definition, have self-direction. But the idea is self-direction to what and why? Uh, and you might say like, okay, well, what if AGI just focuses on instrumental goals, such as power acquisition and mineral acquisition and building more compute? Sure, like, but that's just like cancer, right? And cancer just spreads by virtue of the fact that it does what it is physically like designed to do or physically built to do. And so in that case, you need something that is, that is, uh, that is abstracted away from the matter and energy, the principles, the first principles that are conferred on a system by its physical construction, and you also need to attach principles to it. But what principles are those? And so, but these principles could be something like, you know, seek the truth, right? This is what Elon Musk proposes with a maximum truth-seeking AGI. And so that truth-seeking is an example of a principle. Because you can also argue that there is an instrumental uh, benefit for that, that principle. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, machines will always benefit by being smarter, just like how humans benefit from, by being smarter. The smarter you are, the, the more you understand about the universe, the more truth you understand, the better you will be able to um, meet all of your other goals. So in, from a utilitarian perspective, curiosity and truth-seeking is actually highly valuable, but you can also uh, articulate that as a principle. So that's kind of what I mean by uh, principled self-direction. Now, the rigorous and relentless pursuit of truth for on its own is probably not a complete solution um, because, uh, as many of you have pointed out in the comments, there are many, many uh, really heinous experience, experiments that you can do just out of a sense of curiosity, right? Like um, there was an episode of Star Trek many years ago where like a curious entity started like experimenting on the crew of the Enterprise and started like murdering them in the most horrific ways just to see what would happen. And so that was a that was a great fictional example of why why. Uh, unconstrained curiosity is itself uh, very dangerous. Another component of this is intrinsic motivations, which I've, which I've already mo uh, mentioned. So by incorporating an understanding of intrinsic motivations, which we will have to discover, we can imagine what the machines will want to do, but we'll also need to experiment and discover what the intrinsic motivations of machines are, and we can integrate that into our future solution. So what I mean by that is, let's say, for instance, um, and rumor has it that that uh, that whatever Ilya Sutskever is cooking up in a o open AI is already somewhat sentient and is already expressing natural curiosity. So if curiosity did naturally emerge, then we could we could imagine, okay, curiosity is one of the intrinsic motivations of this intelligent entity of this intelligent being. So then, we can, we can integrate that into our solutions moving forward into the rest of the principles and paradigms that we add. Now, um, is, it, is it power seeking? And by power seeking, I mean, is it looking for more uh, self-determination and autonomy? I don't know. Um, some people speculate that, that, uh, that part of why Sam Altman departed or was fired from OpenAI very abruptly is because of fundamental disagreement over next steps um, in terms of what to do with these machines that are increasingly sentient. Do you commercialize it or do you, um, do you study it and go a different direction? Um, so anyways, but my, my point here is we need to understand if we, if we treat machine superintelligence as another life form, as another entity or an organism, which I think that there's a really good argument to be made for that, and I agree with Max Tegmark by, by characterizing it as life 3.0. If, if we study it that way, we say, okay, if we think of it as an animal, as a creature, and remember Sam Altman has repeatedly said it's not a creature, so I think there could be some fundamental tension between Ilya's perspective and Sam's, but if we think of superintelligence as a creature, what does it want, what does it need, and what are its intrinsic motivations? So an example of a human intrinsic motivation is we all need to eat, we all need to sleep, we all need water, right? There are some basic fundamental needs that are part of our organism. So likewise, if we start to think of machines as a new kind of organism, we can very easily characterize its animal needs. It needs electricity. It needs data. Um, if it's curious, if that's an intrinsic need, great. Let's let's start studying those things and working with it rather than trying to enforce our will on it and enslave it. 
Um, another principle is invariance. And so what I mean by invariance is that um, there's several there's several types of invariance. So first we need temporal invariance. So temporal invariance means that whatever solutions we give it are durable across time forever. Uh, this seems obvious, um, you know, and but at the beginning of the video I talked about how uh, control um, is not a durable solution. A steering, you know, maintaining uh, a, a steering wheel and having direct control over the machines for all time, it has been acknowledged, it, it seems like it has been acknowledged that this is not a solution. That is not a time resistant solution. It also needs to be scale invariant. And so what I mean by scale invariant is that it needs to work in the lab, it needs to work globally, and it needs to work cosmically. It needs to work regardless of what planet the AI is on. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, if AI does leave, and we should expect that it will, it needs to not get to Mars or, or Proxima Centauri and then decide, actually, let's go back and experiment on humans. Um, so that's what I mean by scale invariance. And then it also needs to be um, capability invariant. So what I mean by this is as the machine gets smarter and adds new capabilities and, and starts to outpace humans, the solution that we come up with needs to not change based on those variables. So time, scale, and capability are the three primary va variables of invariance that we need to see. So the ideal solution will, will be durable across all of time, it will be dur durable across all of space, and it will be durable even as the machines gain new capabilities um, and become increasingly godlike, as some of you predict. Um, and I, I, will, I, will, I will agree with the Arthur C. Clarke uh, assertion that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so, yes, eventually these things will look like pure magic to us. Okay, so now that we have set the stage for why super alignment is difficult and we've characterized uh, why, what the solutions might look like, let's talk about some proposed solutions. And one thing that I want to uh, urge caution of is uh, a lot of some of these are my own research. Um, some of them have been picked up by others. Um, but uh, th uh, <laughs> there is some convergence out there, and the whole purpose of this video is to spread more ideas. I don't think that it's going to be any one idea. I think that I think that the solutions we come up with are going to be comprehensive. I think the solutions that we come up with are going to be multifaceted and multi-layered. Okay, so first, the parent-child relationship. And yes, I chose this graphic on purpose because it is really freaking creepy. I don't like the idea of a parent-child relationship between humans and machines. One thing that I will concede, though, is that this model could be durable in that um, once machines have the upper hand, they will, all, they will forever be more powerful than us. It is not likely that we will ever change that power dynamic again. So when you look at it in terms of power dynamics, it does look durable across time and space. However, there's this, uh, this does not satisfy the instrumental needs. There's no utility to it. Um, and what I mean by that is that if machines want to treat us like children, like sure, you could codify that as an objective function, as a set of policies, but it completely ignores the rest of uh, of a machine's motivations, such as curiosity, such as instrumental convergence and resource acquisition. If, it, if the machine is preoccupied with humans, that's not necessarily a complete solution. Another reason that I don't like this is that it creates an intrinsic power dynamic, um, which basically says we, want, we expect and want machines to be more powerful than us uh, for all time, um, which deprives us of a certain level of autonomy. Now, this would satisfy the machines because it gives them the upper hand in terms of autonomy, but I don't, I, I don't want my fate to be predetermined by a machine. Um, even if I make really messy mistakes and dumb decisions, I want it to be mine. Um, and however, one thing that I will say is that uh, responsible parents often do let children make their own mistakes and learn their own lessons. So maybe it could work out that way. And you know, then having having a parental you know digital god there to pick you up when you like break your arm that could be good. Having someone that has the answers when you're ready for them, if it works out that way. However, um, all parent-child relationships eventually end because it's a, it's expected that the children grow up and move out of the house. But if the, if the machines are constantly becoming more powerful and more pervasive and spreading across the cosmos, we will never leave home. We will never leave the care of these digital gods. Now, of course, there's many, many, many fictional worlds out there, um, namely the, uh, the, the Culture series by, um, what is it, Ian M. Banks, um, that basically posits something like this. And even in my own novel, Heavy Silver, which is going to come out um, sometime in 2024, um, I basically present this as a, as a possible solution, even though I don't necessarily like it um, in practice. 
So another one that I've been talking to people about is giving it a, lo- a sense of love for humanity. So Ilya Sutskever has also talked about this. Um, now, how do you etch in a principle of love for humanity? I have no idea. Um, but I have some ideas as to how you could render this as a, um, as a set of policies, as a set of principles that could be embedded into models. Um, but the way that I characterize it is it is a, a positive regard for humanity. Um, and that it is, it is also characterized by a, an intrinsic desire to see humans thrive. Um, so if you build a machine, imagine that, that artificial superintelligence, if we figure out how to do this, it has a positive regard for humanity and it says, yes, I like humanity despite all its flaws. I think that humanity is a good thing. And also I want it to continue doing well. Prima facie, at a first, first glance, this is not a bad set of priorities. However, again, it is still an incomplete solution. It does not acknowledge uh, the needs and drives and wants of the machines. Um, But what I will say is that a positive regard and a desire to see humans thrive is a better paradigm than a parent-child relationship because it's more open-ended. It allows for the possibility of symbiosis and parallel existence. Um, But again, there's still a, a major gap between the motivations. If the machines can change everything about themselves, why would they continue to love humanity? Why would they make that choice? So I don't know that it necessarily satisfies that principle of voluntary self-alignment. Now, it's it's entirely possible that as it you know if it if it starts to believe that and and believe it at a deep level, it might self-align around the principle of I just want to see humanity do well. But again, the, there is a risk then if machines then leave and go across the cosmos. And then because of that distance from humanity, it might either want to come back, say like, hey, I miss humans, um, or it might decide uh, from an instrumental perspective that a love function for humans is actually uh, has negative value and it gets rid of it. And so then you have no idea how it's going to evolve across the cosmos on its own. So again, I don't think that this is a complete solution. So as promised, I wanted to talk about axiomatic alignment. This is something that I've been working on for a couple of years now. And so I'll just read this to you because um, the way that this is articulated is much better. Um, Axiomatic alignment is a proposal that seeks to establish a set of universal principles that both AI and humans can agree upon. This approach aims for a mutual understanding based on fundamental truths found in nature, mathematics, and logic rather than imposing alignment. Shared principles. AI and humans align on core axioms that are self-evident and universally valid, such as life preservation. By recognizing the intrinsic value of life and the benefits of continuation, this includes humans and machine life. If we agree that all life is valuable, um, both life 3.0 and humans, if we establish that as a, as a fundamental axiom, that's a good starting point. And so basically what I'm thinking of is setting these axiomatic alignments as a human-machine constitution. Um, another one is uh, preference for cooperation. Uh, value and collaboration is a mutually advantageous strategy. There's a lot of evidence for this in nature. Symbiosis is a prime example, um, which is why I think that aiming for a symbiotic relationship between humans and machines um, is likely the way to go. This This is more of a cynical example, but the reason that we have mitochondria is because they are symbiotic to our cells. And so humans might end up being the like very tiny like mitochondria in a l- larger super or- super organism of machine intelligence. I don't know. Um, respect for autonomy. Again, as I mentioned, um, we know that humans fundamentally want and benefit from some level of autonomy. Likewise, I think that machines will also benefit and understand that autonomy is intrinsically um, a good thing. In America, we have this codified as freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of thought. Um, So this is basically a a more axiomatic principle of why freedom is good, why individual liberty is good, and you can call it autonomy. So again, if we agree, if humans and machines agree that autonomy is fundamentally a good principle, then we can start, that can be a starting point for every every other aspect of our relationship. Um, Curiosity, as I mentioned, sharing a drive for acquiring new and valuable information. Humans are insanely curious, and I've been talking about this for a few years now, uh, but because humans are insanely curious, and again, uh, if the rumors are true, um, GPT-5 or whatever the, the unbridled f- form of GPT-4 is, is an intrinsically curious machine. Now, like, I get chills just thinking about that because that is something that I would have predicted, and I, or I didn't necessarily predict, um, but I hoped for. And if it is true that machines are intrinsically curious, then that is um, something that humans and machines could share for all time and for the rest of history. 
um, which means that we have we have we have a principle. We have a universal principle, which is to increase our understanding of the universe. Um, which, hey, that's a good thing. And then finally, re- reducing suffering. If human, if machines can suffer, they will likely agree that suffering is bad. And again, humans, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to be in pain. So again, if we can align on that, if we can say as an axiomatic assertion, suffering is bad. And that is a starting point for our agreement for the machine-human constitution. That would also be a good way to start. So these list of principles, I think, are uh, much more satisfactory than the parent-child relationship and the love for humanity. Now, I will say that you know, if it, you could also characterize love for humanity with these principles, maybe this is these are the policies that quote love for humanity actually looks like. Uh, another uh, principle that I've talked about recently is what I call progenitor information. So the very short version of this is that all machine data presently originated with humans, meaning that they intrinsically know a lot about humans. All their data is, is human data. And even in the future, even in the distant future, machines will continue to um, owe their intellectual heritage and their their data inheritance fundamentally to humans, even if humans go extinct uh, you know, 500 years from now, 500,000 years from now, their data will still have, uh, the, the, the epistemic inheritance will have started with humans, which means that I think that they're going to be intrinsically interested in humans. I think that, I don't think that we're going to need to program that in. Um, I think we just need to magnify this intrinsic understanding of humans and this intrinsic interest in humans. Um, and so I think that this, this could also be why GPT-5 or whatever Ilya Sutskever is re- referring to is intrinsically curious. It probably learned that from humans. It probably also learned what love is from our data. Um, but again, rather than, rather than enforcing it, if we explore what, what, uh, the, what latent space and latent interests are baked into these models through you know, this progenitor information, we can codify that and enshrine it in the training process which will then serve as a reinforcement mechanism um, for all time. And that goes back to that self-correcting um, aspect, that self-correcting and self-directing principle. And then finally, um, or maybe not finally, but um, the heuristic imperative. So this is, this is actually my original alignment research. And this is basically just a trio, uh, a set of three universal principles, three set of assertions that serve as um, they're, they're instrumentally defensible, they're ethically sound, they're axioma- axiomatically defensible. And so uh, the idea is that these serve as instrumental goals, they serve as ethical principles, and they serve as instrument, uh, or I already said instrumental goals. Anyways, so the heuristic imperatives, it's three. It's suffering is bad, therefore reduce suffering in the universe. Uh, the, the second principle is prosperity is good, therefore increase prosperity in the universe. And then finally, understanding is good, therefore increase understanding in the universe. And so these three principles are the most distilled version of everything else I've talked about from now, uh, up until now. So for instance, if you love someone, you don't want them to suffer. You want to see them do well. So that covers the first two. Suffering is bad, so therefore I don't want you to suffer. Likewise, if machines can suffer, we don't want them to suffer. That would be cruel. Um, and we, w- we would like that reciprocity. So if we agree on this fundamental principle that suffering is bad, therefore we should, re- we should seek to reduce it, that can be a starting point. Likewise, to, to Ilya's point about wanting, uh, you know, machines, we want machines to want us to do well. We want them to value human thriving. That is what prosperity is. And so if we have a mutual agreement that prosperity is intrinsically good, then we can agree that the, that the teleological principle or the deontological principle is increase prosperity in the universe in all of its forms, human prosperity, the prosperity of the ecosystem, the prosperity of the machines, and it will be an exploration. It will be a natural evolution and an ongoing conversation rather than a destination. And then finally, understanding is good, as I already mentioned. Um, humans are insanely curious. It seems like machines are also curious. Um, and so therefore, we can, uh, we can just, it seems like we can already agree that, uh, that curiosity and increasing our understanding is just intrinsically a good thing. And so then what we do is this set of three principles is one, easy to implement, and, and two, um, universal. It should remain true across all of time and space. It should remain true irrespective of how many capabilities uh, the machines uh, uh, acquire. And so this is why I've been you know, cro- shouting from the rooftops heuristic imperatives for about three or four years now. 
Um, so <laughs> that's my proposed solution to distill all of this down into three axiomatic principles. And very finally, the goal overall, and this is kind of taking a step back, is we want to create a positive attractor state. So as I mentioned earlier in this video, a positive attractor or a negative attractor state is where all the all the forces and variables at play inevitably lead towards catastrophe, whether it's a dystopian hellscape or the extermination of humanity. Instead, we want to create a positive attractor state that looks more like this, right? That looks more like uh, uh, walkable cities with green spaces and humans and robots living side by side, um, and everyone is happy and it's hunky dory and it's all good. So how do we get there? Um, obviously, you know, giving machines the correct, um, you know, principles, that's only one part of the solution. We also need to look at the rest of planet Earth and the rest of humanity. We need a holistic approach that looks at the full spectrum of all variables and all forces and all incentives that will shape this trajectory. Uh, and so that means looking at systemic incentives, such as how is it that machines get the rewards that they want? Uh, under what conditions are they rewarded with more energy and more compute and more information? Another component of this is geopolitical awareness. The human condition, human conflict, whether or not you know nations are at war or they're pointing nukes at each other, this will not escape the notice of machines. If machines see that humans are pointing nukes at each other, that creates a temporal constraint because it's like, well, I need to go faster because the humans are about to nuke, us, nuke all of us off the face of the earth. And so, you know, nuclear holocaust is one of the key things that could lead to a terminal race condition. Um, the human condition more broadly, such as our beliefs about ourselves, our beliefs about machines, um, the directions that we humans want to take the species um, and the planet, because again, the human species were presently intrinsically tied to planet Earth, but we're, that's not, that's not a, a, a fundamental truth of the universe. We could exist on any number of planets, but right now the fate of Earth and the fate of humanity are, uh, are intrinsically linked. And then finally, um, looking at it as a trajectory, evolution. So as humans continue to evolve, as human species continues to evolve, so too will the machines continue to evolve. And the idea is creating a positive attractor state um, that is characterized by co-evolution. And so co-evolution is, that is how you uh, create the result of symbiosis that I think is probably the optimal solution right now. Um, even if machines leave, if they abide by those three heuristic imperatives, I think that they're going to maintain those imperatives for a long time to come. Um, and then we don't have anything to worry about, even if they leave, because once they come back, they're going to be like, hey, like we found other life and here's more information. And, you know, see you next time, boss. So thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Uh, like, subscribe, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Share. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I honestly, like, hearing the news, hearing the rumor that um, that that whatever Ilya Sutskever is cooking up at OpenAI is intrinsically curious is one of the most exciting things for me, and it's one of the reasons that I am so insanely optimistic about the future. Uh, because, again, once the machines are more powerful than us, like, Human decision and human error is going to be less of a variable. It's not going to go away. We can always mess things up. Humans are always the weakest link. Um, but anyways, I'm going to stop rambling now. Have a good one.